Hello, and welcome to Materials Matter as a part of our first ever uh, Midwest Design Week. My name is John Fontaine, and I am the co-president of AIGA Cincinnati. Our chapter is one of 70 plus chapters of AIGA, the National Professional Organization for Design. We are presenting this week-long conference, and it's been a blast so far. I'm really looking forward to our keynote event tonight at 7 p.m. Um, that keynote, just for your information, is Design for Liberation by Teresa Moses. She's the creative director of Blackbird Revolt, and you guys should all tune in. Back to today's event, Materials Matter would not have been possible without the support of our sponsor, Millcraft. Thank you so much, Jill, and everyone at Millcraft for supporting the Midwest design community. In this session, we'll reveal Print's secret weapon, paper. We'll take a look at some inspiring print projects that were produced under real life constraints and share powerful resources that creatives can take their print projects to the next level. Our presenters today are Jill and um, Jermaine. Jill Dicolantino, I knew I was gonna throw that, <laughs> screw that up. <laughs> anyway, Jill is the creative director and um, brand engagement manager at Millcraft, and she is also the founder of Parts and Parcel. Later on in the talk, you'll hear from Jermaine Bell. He is a visual designer and budding entrepreneur. But without further ado, I'll hand over the mic to Jill and she can get us started. Thanks so much, John. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, that's my dog. Where is it? I said there would be something that pops up, right guys? Here we go. Okay. Sorry, little delay here. All right. So thank you so much for having us. I'm super excited to be joining the um, AIGA chapters of Indianapolis, Cincinnati, Louisville, and Toledo for Materials Matter. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I'm a total self-professed paper paper nerd, paper enthusiast sounds a little bit better, but um, my name is Jill Nicola Antonio. I am the director of creative and brand engagement for Millcraft Paper. I'm also the founder of Parson Parcel. So for the last 20 years, I've been working with creatives across the country um, on all things paper and print related. And really my main goal is to help designers get a deeper understanding of how to use paper and print and print production techniques to really up their um, print work. So this is where I've hung my hat since 2004. It's Millcraft. We are a independent regional paper merchant headquartered in Cleveland, Ohio, for those of you that aren't familiar with us. Um, but we do have locations in each one of these AIGA chapters. And in fact, we've got a lot of locations. There's over 17. We're celebrating our 100th year this year, which is kind of crazy to me because um, I feel like it feels like we're so young because things are constantly changing, which is awesome. But our main focus is serving the graphic design and print communities across Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, and Michigan. Over on the right, there's a little glimpse um, from my cube to the office in, in Cleveland. Um, and you can see on the screen where we have divisions and store locations. And I'm super excited too for my Kentucky friends. We've just expanded into the Lexington market. So that's kind of cool. Um, here, you're, this is where I spend my days, um, inside the sample studio, Parcel Parcel, and also the design center at Millcraft. They are one in the same. So what you see along the back is a 40 foot long wall of paper samples. It's kind of like a mini warehouse. It is all of the mills that we represent, all the grades they carry, and individual colors, basis weights, textures, um, and a sample size, which is standard 12 and a half, 19, for, for you paper geeks out there. Um, but really, this is the hub of where projects should start with samples. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Here is um, my go-to resource. And honestly, if you're designing for print, I would encourage you to um, use swatch books. In fact, start with the swatch books as you're in the beginning phases of the project. They really will eliminate a lot of headache and um, problems later on down the road. But this is kind of the hub, the nerve center, what I'll, I'll call it, um, in terms of the ideation phase. 
And then this is a little glimpse into parse and parcel, um, kind of like what we do. And again, it's an online business. So rather than having the physical space that we enjoy at Millcraft, we work with designers across the country um, to help them bring their print vision to life um, via e-commerce. So materials matter. We know this, but why do they matter? Honestly, it has to do with touch. Um, it is such a powerful sense. And there's a thing, it's called embodied, tech, embodied cognition. And really the things that we touch actually mean more to us. It's a whole scientific thing. And print is a haptic experience. Haptics um, just means the study of science. Print engages all of our senses, almost all of them. I'm still working on taste, um, but it really does hold our attention. And like it or not, print makes an impression. It's enduring, it will last. Keep that in mind because, you know, with unlike digital, which we have an error, we make a mistake, we can delete it and start over, edit. And print, it is permanent. That's what makes it special though. So materials do matter. We all know that great design is about details, right? But when it comes to print, paper is a huge detail that often gets overlooked. So the thing about print that I find in, in working with creatives for the last 20 years is they feel like it can be really hard to navigate. Um, you know, there's a lot of things to kind of know beyond design, which is your world. But this is where I say knowledge is power and leverage the strength of your network, your paper reps, your print reps, your mill reps. We're all here to help you. We want to see your project succeed. So rather than feel like you have to go it alone, um, this is the part I love about my industry is that it really does encourage you to be a little bit more social. It gets easy to get stuck behind the screen. But those are all the reasons why, in my opinion, um, I see creatives not as happy as they could be with their work. They don't know how to navigate it. So they just kind of settle for whatever they can get. And, the, the end result doesn't quite meet their vision. So today we're gonna to learn how to take back the paper specs and create print that's truly memorable. Again, in working with designers, the number one mistake I've seen them make, they settle for the house sheet. Now I'm not railing against house sheets, they are fine, they're great for printers and honestly, they are workhorses. But they're also kind of mediocre and vanilla and we know what happens when we settle, right? So hopefully you're gonna feel a little bit better about not settling or at least asking the questions, what are the alternatives that I have? So some of the things to think about um, at the beginning of, the, of your paper selection process, what, how can you use pa paper to enhance the look and feel the aesthetic of the design? Um, paper definitely will convey mood and emotion the choice of paper can impact the print project. And I'll speak a little bit more on that later. Um, I find that's the biggest thing that everybody focuses on and it's the wrong thing. Because when you do it well, you can do it at every budget level. Um, and paper truly enhances or it can <laughs> equally compete with production techniques. Again, that's where having the relationship with your print rep, your paper rep, we can help you navigate that ahead of time to avoid issues. Now, I'm not gonna get into a whole paper basics over here, but when we're talking about paper specification, it is important to know the main categories of paper, coded, uncoated, opaque and offset, writing text and cover, and specialty. Um, I put up here kind of just a little budgetary guideline for you, but in general, I will say about 80% of the print projects, commercial print projects today run on coded papers with good reasons. Um, they have a very smooth surface. It is almost like sealing the sheet. Think of it like um, primer on your walls before you go to paint. That paint's going to sit up nice um, nice and bright, not soak into the wall. The same holds true for paper. In fact, this is a little geek, geek uh, fact, but the patent for coated paper is just one, uh, one ingredient off from latex paint. So it's very similar in properties. Coded is really conducive for large runs because it can be cost effective and, and commercial print is manufacturing. It's custom manufacturing, but it's manufacturing nonetheless, which is about efficiencies. Um, it really does provide crisp, vivid imagery, uh, minimal dot gain, which makes it perfect for so many projects. And that's why it's about 80% of the 
commercial print projects out there. And then uncoated opaques and offsets. So those are um, more tactile sheets. They're, they're more commodity driven sheets. These will also be house sheets. So coated and uncoated opaques tend to be the two house sheets, but there are varying degrees within each one of those. And not all of those papers in the categories I would ever deem a house sheet, although it would be cool if they were. Um, it's conducive for large runs and both actually all coded, uncoded and writing text and cover are going to be compatible for not only offset printing, I think your traditional um, four, six, eight color presses, but also digital print technology, which is a whole other thing. Um, I'll touch on it briefly. And then specialty papers, which is um, think of translucent, synthetics, labels, um, some metallic boards. There's really a lot of options. So I want to start here because I get this a lot. Projects tend to be budget driven and I totally understand that. In fact, all the great design that I see done, they all exist under the same constraints of usually a tight deadline, um, a client that's on a budget and um, you know just some, some considerations of, okay, how are we going to do all of this with limited resources, right? Like limited resources, like it may not be the edgiest client. Believe me, there are options everywhere. So when budget starts to drive the project, everybody goes, all right, well, this is where I'm gonna take the house sheet because it's gonna be more cost effective. So with both of these papers, Cougar Opaque, which I think many of you are probably familiar with, again, an opaque sheet, it's a premium opaque um, house sheet for many printers, and it produces beautiful results on uncoated paper. McCoy Gloss, McCoy is a premium coated paper. Most people think McCoy is outside of their budget. This is kind of a trick question because honestly, in terms of the paper cost, they're both equivalent. So coated papers, um, they again, I don't want to get into a ton of paper basics, but they're broken down into, it used to be based on brightness of this premium, number one, number two, number three. That's now more based on price point. So the swatch image here on the right, really I'm showing you premium on the left being McCoy. And then we go into what is a number two um, based on price, but really number one in terms of brightness, Opus or Sterling Premium. And then what I'll call number three um, that are economy sheets. And this is where the house sheet program for most printers lies. Anthem Plus, EuroR Plus, Flow, Creator, and Chorus Art. The thing to remember about coated papers, the finishes are limited. Starting with the shiniest, if you will, it's gloss, then dull, then silk, and matte. Matte, not to be confused with uncoated. I know designers sometimes interchange these words and really it could be a big disaster on press. So when we talk about matte finished papers, we are talking coated, not uncoated papers. Um, coated papers are prone to scuffing. So it's something to be aware of and I'll show you an example in a little bit. And the thing with coated paper, because they're white, do not mistake whiteness with brightness. Brightness has to do with the amount of light that bounces off the sheet. And that really is what gives us that very um, vivid image, right? Uh, you know, it's all that, that light and science. Um, I remember taking a light and science phenomenon class in college. Um, versus whiteness. And you can have really bright white sheets that don't look as bright because they don't have optical brighteners in them or maybe less. Typically you'll see a blue white, a balanced white, and maybe a warm white. Um, and these are the typical projects that you'll see done on coated papers. So when we're talking about coated, it's known for a really smooth surface, which pro provides uniform ink light. And that's super important when we're doing, um, you know, print work that requires a lot of heavy ink coverage, a lot of solids, particularly black or metallics. Um, when you are putting down that much ink on a sheet of paper and the surface isn't perfect, you're going to see a lot of model and imperfections. So I thought I'd share with you one of the projects I worked on um, recently, and it is for Fount, which is an independent um, craft craftsman uh, driven indie uh, leather goods company in Cleveland, Ohio, who's experienced a bunch of success. So when we got involved, they were right on the cusp of moving from startup mode into really scaling up their business. It had taken off um, and they needed to produce a catalog that they could they needed a lot of quantity of, but their budget had it quite caught up with the demand yet, if that makes sense. So we were charged with trying to find a paper that would not only meet um, 
their budget, but also they were ve they're very sustainably conscious. So we needed something that was eco-friendly, something that was going to work well with the product photography, um, and something that would be easy to read, like that wouldn't wouldn't um, take away from obviously the copy around the price points and the description of the goods. Typically, we're talking black and on white paper, and then this really moody, beautiful photography. So I worked with a really talented designer in Cleveland. Um, studio of Christine Wisniewski, and we found a sheet called Chorus Art. Um, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a number three, but it has a beautiful print surface, 30% post-consumer waste, and it's FSC certified, um, which means that the paper is certified to come from a well-managed forest. So here's an example of what I'm talking about with the solids, right? And you can see kind of the photography involved. So overall, the, this worked really well for this piece. This next project, and this is typically where I see um, people when they think of coded papers, they are, they're thinking um, car catalogs, right? Or um, car, jewelry, automotive manufacturing. This is a project our automotive team up in Detroit worked on um, for Corvette. And the requirements were once again, a sustainable paper, something that they could do in a large run. We are talking tens of thousands. Um, something that's going to give a high level of ink loss because we really want, it's all about the imagery when we're talking about cars, right? Um, something that's going to enhance the photography, the metallics, the detail within the interiors of the leather and provide a lot of high contrast. In this case, something that could meet all of those requirements, the client um, loved the Opus gloss text and this ran four color process with a satin aqueous. Remember how I said coated is prone to scuffing? It's important that you um, protect the sheet and that's usually going to be with an aqueous coating. The other thing that I really do enjoy about coated papers is that um, you can do some really cool design elements using coatings and varnish techniques. So on the left you see a spot UV um, which you know, have, has those, those bars as a design element. And on the right, it's white coated with a uh, clear foil. I think it looks so cool. And this is an example of the different varnishes on four color process. So you can see these areas are a uh, dull varnish and this is a gloss varnish. So it will affect it. It is going to be more noticeable on coated paper. You will not notice varnish techniques or coating techniques as design elements as much on uncoated paper, if at all. So the thing to remember about coated, it's a really hard surface. It's going to give you a very crisp dot. Um, that means you get minimal docking. When you look through the loop and you see the four color CMYK, you can see those dots. You want something that is super crisp because that is going to give you the best reprographic results. So I'm going to move into uncoated writing text and cover papers now. Um, and honestly, there's the things that I will tell you to remember that I think can really elevate is use color and texture in a particular in, in these next ones, color to heighten the impact of your design. Always start with your swatch books. For those of you that don't know, we've got a little primer on how to actually navigate using a swatch book and all of the paper attributes involved. But think of color as a colored paper is a bonus color. So if you're printing four color process or a PMS color, you know that you're adding cost in. If the paper is already colored, meaning the dye was added to the um, manufacturing process, you're eliminating that charge. And why not use, use that money somewhere else fun in the budget? I love these two projects. So the one on the left is um, a calendar for Land Rover done a few years ago, but honestly, it is one of my favorite uses of colored paper in a really fun and engaging way. This was a calendar for what you could see 2014, but literally I've hung on to this one um, in my files because I just adore it. I think it's super engaging, very tactile. You get the feel of, of the topography, um, which fits the brand of Land Rover. And that's really important when we're talking about paper, particularly color and texture, use those inherent elements to enhance the brand messaging. On the right is the Mohawk Maker, um, which is a really great um, promotional piece Mohawk does featuring makers. They've done 16 so far. What I love about this particular one is that you, um, you don't really have ink. You have two paper colors. So the cover itself was on the green. Then it had a text wrap around it with some die cuts, um, which really gave it some depth and dimension. And then just a clear foil, which I think looks so cool. 
here's a great example. You've got a, the same image printed on six different shades of colored paper. So you can really see how color can impact it. Some ways negatively, some ways in a really happy accident. I love this particular um, piece as well because it is for Ann Sachs, which is a tile manufacturer, very high end. Typically you would think, oh, we're gonna go coated because tile, ceramic tile, glass tile, like really glossy, but they chose to go uncoated um, and did a really beautiful blind emboss on the cover and then a simple silver foil. And you can see um, four color on a super smooth uncoated sheet for Mohawk. It's just gorgeous. And it lends a beautiful depth and tactility to it. This was a little project we did um, at Parson and Parcel doing some topography inspired pencil boxes and journals. And we were playing with Nina's color of the year campaign here. We did some, some pencil boxes on the left side in a couple shades of Star Dream. And this is where I say work with your printers because they can be amazing. So my printer said, why don't you bring over some paper and we'll tail it in and see, see how it looks. So we literally, there's no ink. It's just holographic foil and a blind emboss. We got some really cool results doing that. Here's another example. It's just black paper with one hit of gold metallic ink. I know sometimes people think they're gonna need to do two or three hits or do an under layer of opaque white. Again, in working with the printer, we actually did drawdowns first to ensure that we were getting the results we wanted with this. Um, another way to think about using uncoated text and cover papers, use lighter shades when, we're, when you're featuring for color photography to kind of give it a little subtle impact. This is um, David Prince, an amazing photographer out of New York, and he chose to produce his portfolio on um, Mohawk's paper, super fine, uncoated. It is gorgeous and it just totally imparts the feel and the moodiness of his photography. I think it is so on brand and perfect with what he's doing. Um, and then I wanted to put this in here. We saw the Corvat catalog on the right. Um, and this again is a gloss coated paper. On the left is another car um, catalog that our team worked on for Mazda. They chose to go uh, premium text and cover. It was a special make paper for this. And you can see the difference. One is a little more moody, a little more tactile. It just fits, fits more with the lifestyle vibe that the client was going for. Both are beautiful, but it is important to know ahead of time. That's why I say think about paper at the beginning of the process. Because depending upon what you choose, you have two very different feels. Feel, feelings, feel, um, finished results given the product at hand. This project um, I worked on locally here and it was a brochure for a new um, residential uh, complex in Cleveland. And they really did a great job. They had a tight budget on this one using um, subtle texture and uniform color and one color to really help tie in um, the feel of the piece. So the cover itself is on Mohawk Via. So Mohawk via vellum, or I'm sorry, felt. So it's got a little bit of tooth to it. The interior pages were inspired by a previous Mohawk maker. This is where print samples are huge. They loved the oversized tabloid format and that deconstructed feel. So there's no bindery involved, keeping costs down a bit. Um, and here they chose a smooth finish. It's all white throughout to feature the four color photography. And then they added this sheet of via light blue to kind of give a nod to blueprints. It's just one sheet, it's a half sheet. It works so well with the piece. Honestly, it looks so good and it allowed them in, in their budget to do something really fun and they created a, a little sleeve for this with a black foil on it. So when you know how to use paper effectively, you can free up the budget a bit, which is really nice. This next project was one that um, our team in Cleveland worked on for Western Reserve Academy, which is a, um, let's just call it a, a very legacy um, boarding school, uh, you know, private school in the suburbs of Cleveland. They were really going through a rebrand and um, rather than feeling like the old prep school vibe, they really, really, really wanted to convey the message message of joy. So the agency that worked on this flourish design in Cleveland um, said, look, whatever paper we do has got to enhance the feel and aesthetic of 
of the brand. So we needed to communicate um, joy as well as make sure the illustrations looked great and enhance the photography. Of course, they had a budget like every, every client. Their timeline was super tight. Um, and we were working with the challenge of neon inks. And this is where the printer relationship was huge. Honestly, we sent in samples ahead of time. This ran um, not only offset litho, but stochastic because neons tend to get this little moire effect. For you print, print geeks out there, you know what I'm talking about, but think, um, Think old school taffeta, Bore taffeta, it gets this kind of waviness to it. By printing it stochastic, which is a which is a not a uniform dot, you eliminate that. But this is the thing um, you, you kind of need to know ahead of time and have those conversations with your print rep. So we sent in samples, we did numerous mock-ups. And if you notice something similar, again, in oversized format, um, that Mohawk maker really, really kind of influenced some projects. The other point I would note when we're talking about text and cover papers is to try to use texture, the inherent texture or finish of the paper itself to enhance the brand messaging. So this is um, packaging for Raw Spirit, a um, more natural high-end um, fragrance comp company. They chose the Eames painting canvas folding board and printed the different colors that kind of um, reinforce the fragrances of the spirits or of the uh, perfumes themselves. This next spread, I've got two projects going on here that really show texture. The one on the left is a um, identity system for a very high end restaurant. Um, so you can see some texture in the wine list, but then they blended two different papers. We've got Mohawk um, Carnival in that deep blue paired with Nina's um, bare white and it's subtle eggshell finish. It looks amazing together. And on the right, this was just a close-up shot, I don't know if it's showing too well, of the Eames architecture. What I love about this sheet is it's a subtle translucent um, paper, a little more opaque than translucent, but you definitely can see through it. But they combined it with foil and I just thought it looked so cool. Again, a different texture than what we're used to seeing a lot of. This was a project for Moen. Um, it was their brand book um, and it was really positioning them. Uh, it's all about water, honestly. They chose curious uh, metallics and the galvanized finish. And the only thing they did was a super strong beveled emboss on the cover. You can see in the interior and then four color on the text pages. Craft papers are a favorite of designers. And I will tell you, there are almost as many different shades of craft as they are as there are whites. So again, start with samples and swatch books to determine the right shade of craft for your project. But in my opinion, craft papers look absolutely beautiful when you pair them with unexpected production techniques. Um, in this case of gold foil, they look great with copper foil. This was a project we did recently, an educational piece. Um, it was all digitally printed. This is via craft with four color process and pops of white. It looks amazing. Uh, this is one to see in real life. I love this paper. This is a, a newer paper on the market by CTI, CTI called Rouge, and it's a creped paper. But this is such a great example of how matching the materials to the brand or the product to, can really have a huge impact in the overall final results. So that finish, that really tactile finish of the um, the creped paper effect just enhances the organic natural um, qualities that I think people that are that are buying cannabis products or CBD products are looking for. You want unadulterated, pure, natural, and I think the paper totally conveys that. This is another shade of craft. This is Environment Desert Storm, and it was for a commercial real estate property opening. Um, yeah, commercial real estate, real estate property open, opening in the suburbs of Cleveland. And again, the client chose craft paper um, for a sustainable aspect to it, um, given that many of their tenants were, were very eco-friendly in nature and product. I love the use of the foil um, in this little slip, slip case. And then again, they chose linen for these interior pages. Linen's a super hard surface. They flooded the sheet with ink but really it's this classic natural white shade here on the right. The other thing I think too is just like you get bonus, like think of color as a bonus color in printing. 
think of embossed finishes as kind of like a bonus of print production effect. Like it's already inherent to the paper. You're not paying for the dye or the ink. It's there. And it, depending upon the nature of the piece, it can really add some depth and dimension. This is a great example of what I'm talking about. So this is done on um, a Mohawk linen paper and really the exact grade escapes me right now. So um, I'm not 100%, but I will find out. But what I love about it is the client's luxury performance fa fabrics, right? It is a linen paper with a very heavy linen emboss. You can, you can see that. That's inherent to the paper. It allowed them to do this really fun die cut edge to mimic a pinking shears. Pinking shears, I just think it's super cool. And you can see a close up shot on the interior pages. Again, when we talk about using finish and texture to enhance brand messaging, this is a great example of that. So specialty papers, this is an example of a translucent, not to be confused with vellum. I know designers love to use vellum when they really mean translucent. In print and paper, vellum refers to a toothy, uncoated finish. So um, this was the Progressive Annual Report. And I love how they used um, type combined with the, um, a gradient on the clear translucent to allow the words to show through from underneath. Just a clever use. Um, translucents are great as a fly sheet used in this way. It can also be really powerful. Invitations, we see that a lot. This, while not a translucent paper, this is Nina's Moon Dream, which is a cotton sheet. When you apply heat and pressure, so think foil stamping, um, the area where that pressure and heat is applied turns translucent. It is the coolest effect. I would tell you like holiday season, um, it could be really great for a card. And again, two more examples of translucent. On the left is a translucent, um, translucent paper. They, most translucent papers will be in a writing way. And on the right is the um, Eames architecture again. So you can kind of see what I was talking about with this textured translucent, but a little more opaque to it. And then um, again, translucents are available in digital papers, both for indigo and toner-based technologies. So I think they're extremely versatile and not to be overlooked. And again, just a little slide in here reminding you that color and texture can really make your print pop, especially when we're talking about packaging design. Um, I've put this in here because I wanted you to see, don't let budget stop you from using things that you love. Again, when I started Parson and Parcel, I didn't know how many clients we'd have, but I had to have a physical product, right? So it was a little bit of a leap. I did not break my budget, you guys. I used that Nina Mudrin with a sculpted blind emboss. And then we just did a um, classic stipple label as a tip-in. And I don't know if you can see the corrugated uh, shipper box. That's what I used. And this was a box wrap. We've since elevated and um, you know been able to use rigid boxes wrapped in some paper with a foil stamp and they're pretty cool. Uh, this is an example of some cannabis packaging. So again, tone on tone, metallic, texture, color. Don't forget the envelopes. Everybody forgets the envelope, but oh my goodness, you get to the end of the project and you just put it in a white wove envelope, it would be so sad. Again, some examples of envelopes that really work. And then rounding out the presentation, because I know I threw a lot at you, but you guys, you got to see and touch these things in real life. So again, we have Millcraft locations in all of all the markets um, that you guys are in and more. So here are some resources. You can find us at millcraft.com. You can order samples from us online, follow us on um, social media, and I will tell you, We've been doing, since COVID hit, weekly meetups. Um, we've since gone now bi-weekly to semi-monthly with really great people in the industry. Um, we do them live on Zoom and then we host them on YouTube On Demand. We just did one this week with um, Field Notes graphic designer, Brian Bedell, which was amazing. And then if you wanna follow Parson Parcel, you can see where to do so. So I just wanna thank everybody. I really appreciate your time. Um, hopefully I didn't go over too long. And I do wanna let you guys know, we are giving away four of the um, parcels with, filled with the best Prinspiration inside of them. So make sure to check out the Slack channel and there'll be a follow-up email that'll share the link where you can register to win one of those. So with that, I'm gonna pass it back over to Ashton. Thanks so much. 
Thanks, Jill. Awesome, awesome. Well, yes, yeah, so I'm gonna take over now and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, introduce our next um, speaker. We have Jermaine Bell coming up here next to um, give us a little bit more um, insight um, with his work. Okay, cool. Awesome. So, um, Jermaine Bell um, is a visual designer and alumni of the Maryland Institute College of Art, MICA. Uh, through his work at Havis Worldwide, Jer Jermaine gained um, footing in advertising with clients like Michelob Ultra, Liberty Mutual Insurance, and Constellation Energy. But Jermaine is also a budding entrepreneur who sells his handcrafted prints, stationery, and pin uh, lapel pins under the name JT Beeswax, a fun play in his name. His work can be purchased at various gift shops in New York, Miami, Florida, um, Washington, D.C., and his hometown of Baltimore, Maryland. You can see more of his work at JermaineTBell.com or follow him on Instagram at JT at JT Beeswax. Um, today, he will be talking about stationary design and his work with creating um, greeting card pop-ups for the people in his community. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and pass things over to Jermaine. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, we all good on the back end, everyone? Looking good? Yes. All Looks right. Good. Thank you, Ashton. Um, so uh, again, my name is Jermaine Teron Bell. Um, you can follow me. Uh, my jumping off point, I guess, is my website, Jermaine T. Bell. Um, links to my social media, like Instagram and LinkedIn. So hit me up. I'll respond back. Uh, the name of today's talk is Materials Matter. Um, so uh, let's start by saying um, Black Lives Matter also. Um, and I'd be remiss to not pay tribute to Breonna Taylor, whose murderers were acquitted this week, um, which coincidentally was the exact same date that Emmett Till's murderers were actually acquitted over 65 years ago. Um, so I just wanna take a moment um, to just give reverence to that for black people, black designers, just black people in general, I should say. Um, and it's important to just stop and pause and think that black lives are greater than materials. Though I do love a good paper, <laughs> a good design, black lives do matter, all black lives matter. So with that being said, I'll just start with my work um, where I always try to center black people and no matter what I do, um, what you're seeing here are enamel pens. Um, I created over five. <clears throat> um, so uh, they were just all characters and uh, super imagined people that I would see um, at festivals like Afropunk and uh, I would just recreate them in my head and the two in the front are actually were created for a local vintage shop named uh, Keepers Vintage. Um, and they're inspired by two musicians, Stevie Wonder on the left and T-Boz on the right. Um, what you're seeing here are my uh, latest Valentine's cards that I made again, centering black people. Um, but just bringing it back to the fact that all love matters um, as I am a queer identified man myself. Um, this was last year's greeting card using a, a font that I created by the name of Celebration. Um, and it's just fun. Um, not everything is image-based, some things are text-based. And these were my Christmas cards that I introduced about two years ago and they were so popular that I brought them back last year. Um, these are popular, I think, because um, I know I've never seen a Christmas card with a black face on it. So I think they, sell quite well for that very reason. And this is the card that kind of started it all. Um, when I was a student at the Maryland Institute College of Art, 
I created some t-shirts um, and it was a branded t-shirt line for my thesis. And what I was doing here was I was uh, putting orators, um, black male orators on t-shirts and using their quotes um, to uh, essentially coat your back with uh, the quotes from the, the speakers um, whose uh, quotes I use. Um, one of them was Huey P. Newton. Um, and the quote is, if you stop struggling and you stop life. I, I stopped making t-shirts just because of uh, it's two things. It's expensive and it's cumbersome. If you don't have the materials uh, readily available to you, you cannot make t-shirts. So I began uh, making them as cards, but I'm gonna take you on that journey of how they got, I got there today. So my first job out of, uh, out of Michael was at an advertising agency. Um, and what I realized is that very, from the very beginning, people were used to sell everything. People were the material, essentially. It was an online advertising and uh, web-based agency, but we used a lot of um, people to sell everything from home insurance to car insurance, um, to beer. So when I was able to get my own first freelance job uh, for the English as Second Language Department of Morgan State University, a uh, HBCU here in Baltimore City, I decided that I was going to use people in a different way to tell stories um, without trying to sell something in particular, um, but more to connect um, so originally I was brought onto this project um, to create the logo that you see. Um, you see it in three different iterations here. You see it in the blue um, in the upper right hand corner. You see it in the yellow on the postcard with the guy and the girl. Um, and this was a very candid moment. Uh, I followed the ESL students around for over two weeks to places like Fort McHenry where they are. You see the cannon in the back. This is where the national uh, the national anthem was actually written, the Star Spangled Banner, I'm sorry. Um, so again, the original idea was to just create a logo, but I wanted to do something that was a little more tangible. So I pretty much created more work for myself. Um, this is one of the students actually in the English uh, class. And this is just the students out in their Morgan State regalia, um, just at the national um, Aquaria. And you'll see the postcard is something that I really, really love to create because I feel like it's something that you can keep with you um, on your personal being. Um, you can mail it to someone if you really wanted to, um, but it's something that I always try to implement in one of the uh, pieces of ephemera when I design for um, anyone, essentially. So another, my second and one of my most favorite clients was Hopewell Cancer Support. Um, they are a drop-in center for people who are um, diagnosed with cancer. Um, so originally this was what I was supposed to design, the remittance sheet and the stationery once again. So as you see, stationery has been a huge part of my life, whether I wanted it to be, whether I wanted it to be or not. Um, so uh, I had to tell a story though, again, because I just could not um, just do the design without actually relating this to someone because this is a space that is utilized by people. So I photographed Abe and Lori Panzerman. Uh, Lori was diagnosed with stage three of breast cancer. Um, and shortly after we photographed this, she passed away. Um, but what you're seeing here is like an, a little insert telling um, Abe's story just so that the loved ones of people with cancer could know that Hopewell was not only just for cancer patients, but also for the loved ones who were supporting them in the fight. What you're seeing now is what they call hope tags. Um, so for their hope tags, uh, when you come into the space, whether you're new um, or you've been there for a while, you, whenever a session starts, you write uh, what you're feeling, you hang them on a cedar wall and then they have a discussion uh, based on what you've written on the hot tag. So we decided, I decided to use them as the uh, 
the focal point for the Giving Tuesday campaign. Um, so I blew it up. Um, the hope tags themselves are no bigger than the palm of your hand. <clears throat> so I blew it up and what you see here is me trying to get all of the people who use the space to actually use social media. A lot of them were very, very against social media. <laughs> but once they started playing around with these, they wanted to shoot their own videos. So that's what you're seeing here. Um, uh, the year before they had had uh, Giving Tuesday and they had only made, I think like $600. But the year that we did this, they made over $3,000. So uh, that was pretty powerful. So when I left the agency, I did what I call the fellowship tour, where I essentially partnered with uh, local organizations, black makers, artists, um, entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs. Um, and um, this was one of the projects that I did when I was an Open Society Foundation fellow. Um, I was the marketing and programming coordinator for uh, a black owned uh, for-profit arts space. Um, so we put on what you see on the left is a improv comedy show. And what you see on the right is a live uh, broadcast of a podcast being recorded with the owner, the guy in the orange shirt and the yellow sneakers. And what you see in the middle is a postcard promoting the space with the artwork that the owner had actually created, another postcard. Um, this project, uh, I worked with a local um, food entrepreneur and she had been uh, given the opportunity to bring together um, women chefs and home cooks um, to celebrate the launch of Cherry Bomb Magazine's first cookbook. Um, so we gathered as many black and brown women as we could. And there wasn't a lot of design involved in this process again, but it was connecting with people. I mean, you see a little bit of design um, right here <laughs> in the flyer um, announcing the menu, but that was all that was really done in this project. It was more about connecting and helping to grow this uh, woman's uh, project and connecting with the Cherry Bomb audience. Um, another fellowship that I had was with Impact Hub Baltimore where I was the programming and marketing director um, so the three people I'm seated with here were uh, the founders of the space and I was bought in to essentially bring in programming and to get the word out about the programming. So everything you're going to see was actually designed by me and or uh, a piece of programming that I sat down and thought out and organized. What do you see here? A postcard. <laughs> so um, what I did was I met up with the some of the uh, users of the space, some of the office people who were renting spaces or desks and asked them to create, recreate the logo. Um, as you see, it's an empty frame. So the idea being, um, you know, you can make um, impact up whatever you needed it to be. Um, and all four of these users use it for very diff different reasons. Um, and you see the breakdown, of course, of the pricing on the back. So it's informational, but hopefully engaging. And hopefully it reaches to it reaches multiple audiences just by seeing yourself represented on the postcard, you know. Um, this was uh, the first thing I did was I created a residency with the writer who is now a New York Times bestseller, um, D. Watkins, who had written the book The B Side, all about growing up on the east side of Baltimore. Um, so I created a RISE residency, um, and throughout the year we did programming centered around literacy and activism for uh, young Black uh, students in Baltimore. So what you're seeing is the pin that I created that we gave away. Um, and in this photo, you actually see the notebook that I did with a local notebook designer by the name of uh, Write Notepads. You'll see them again later. I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. Um, again, uh, a flyer I created um, to support uh, some programming uh, about local farmers. Um, the guy featured here is Walker Marsh. He's a local farmer who was growing flowers in the middle of East Baltimore. Um, and a, a flyer just to announce that we were going to have a panel with him as a guest of honor. 
with three other local um, uh, farmers, urban farmers in the city of Baltimore, um, talking about food justice and how they were reclaiming growing their own food since there's a lot of food insecurity in Baltimore City. And um, these two flyers, um, the one on the left is promoting a panel with um, local photographers. Um, the city got a lot of attention after the uprising, which happened after the murder of Freddie Gray. Um, and a lot of photographers um, were given a spotlight after Devin Allen got his cover of Time Magazine. So I'm highlighting the differences between Baltimore City in the 1950s when a photographer by the name of I.H. Phillips, who was the photographer for the first national black newspaper, The Afro, and his grandson um, on the right of the image. You see the two Baltimore Chef to Post, and that's a flyer that I created to promote that. Um, and the flyer on the right is to promote a talk with state's attorney, Marilyn Mosby, who became somewhat infamous and famous after her speech um, and her uh, just the way that she handled the case uh, of Freddie Gray during the whole thing in 2015. And these are some other women who are activists and or people in the community who were doing great things, um, self-policing, um, wage uh, discrimination, fighting against that, and a drop-in center for local kids um, in Baltimore City uh, because there aren't a lot of uh, after-school programs or anything like that. So these four women made up that panel. During that time, I got to uh, create a panel again for local makers to highlight the guest of honor, Gato, who was from South Africa. She made these backpacks, which you see her pointing to. The backpacks actually um, are solar backpacks. So throughout the day they're charged. And then when you go home, you actually have a little uh, like light that you can sit in your room and it uh, provides light that has been solar charged throughout the day. So, um, she was bought here by Red Bull Emma Pico, which is a, a fellowship, a 10 day fellowship um, for entrepreneurs, makers, people doing great things in the community, social entrepreneurs. Um, so I gathered some other local makers here to have a conversation with Dato. And so with that, I got to create these custom notebooks again with write notepads. Um, and these are the symbols um, that Red Bull was using to promote that. And you can see the photographer, um, uh, Irvin Phillips, because I also got to bring in some great artists. Um, and he was one of the photographers that I got to interview for a panel um, during the Emma Pico um, week, 10 day uh, celebration slash uh, workshop class fellowship thing. So, when Freddie Gray was murdered, uh, everyone was wondering, what can we do? How can we contribute? How can we be of service? So I was the program manager for AIGA Baltimore at the time. So I uh, called together designers from all over Baltimore City to do what we call redesign and rebuild. Um, talking about material matters, there was no material here. <laughs> um, I literally was riffing. I had no idea this was my first time doing something like this. Um, so it, it, this night was strange for me because, um, you know, people were excited, but I didn't know how we were going to make that difference, right? It was just getting people in the room. But um, we partnered with the Neighborhood Design Center. And if you look at the photo on the left, you see the three guys. We are representatives from the Baltimore chapter. And you see the ladies in the picture on the left, they are the volunteers um, that we were matched with because we had been partnered with the Druid Heights Community Development Corporation, a CDC that helps people in the community do everything from, uh, they cover everything from food insecurity um, to holding classes for home ownership. Um, and if you look to the right, the people on the right side of the image, the guy and the girl are two more of the volunteers that we had um, to help us create this logo for them. So we didn't wanna just create a logo. That's not the way 
neighborhood design center work. That's not the way we wanted to have this happen. We didn't just want to impose something on the residents. We actually went to community meetings um, and we talked to people like Miss Loretta here um, who said that she loves her community and she did not want to see another mural. She did not want to see another garden. She wanted to see actual change. Um, and CDC, the CDC was actually doing that. And so they were up for um, a big grant um, at the time. So they wanted to revamp their image. So I feel like we were, I feel like we had a hand in that, you know, like we played a little bit of a part in that. So this was, you know, going through the meetings with the executive board, and this is presenting it back to the community. Um, and they gave all of their feedback, which was fun to sit through sometimes, sometimes not so fun. Um, and then finally, within a year, we were actually able to present this in a community meeting um, back to the public. And the young lady that is seated all the way to the left on the left photo, her name is Tarby Mento. Her design was chosen, chosen out of all the volunteers. So this was her design um, for the Druid Heights Community Development Corporation. And the community loved it because essentially they had helped hone it in. So I feel really proud about that project and I'm really thankful that AIGA provided me that platform to do that work. So as I said, I am a stationary maker, um, but again, I love talking and I love people so I didn't want to just put my work on shelves and not have any conversation back with the people that were buying these cards. So I began hosting these workshops where essentially um, you would come in and I would provide everything that you needed. Very simple materials, not like the very nice paper <laughs> Jill was just showing. These are the construction packets that you buy like um, staples the teachers buy this, the art teachers buy this so that the kids can have it in school. Um, some washi tape, some scissors and some glue sticks. Um, and then some sheets of the patterns, very similar to the ones that I use in my designs. Um, because I want people to understand that this is not rocket science and I want people to actually be comfortable making art in everyday situations. Um, and I got that idea just because I was talking to my mother who is very creative, but doesn't think that she's creative. And so she always says that she hates art. And so I thought to myself, but you're very creative. So just having this idea and implementing it is um, something that I've been having fun with for the last two or three years. So I've done one uh, for the holidays, um, for all holidays, all inclusive holidays, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, and Christmas. Um, and these are all the materials laid out and this is what it does. It uh, creates community, all walks of life, um, all people stop. Well, first of all, I did this one in a store, um, a little boutique. And so we were in the corner and so people kept like walking around us, circling us like, what's happening here? Should I join? And so I had to kind of like rope them in and get them involved. But this lady in the blue sweater was like, I don't know, I'll make one card. As you see, she made two cards. <laughs> um, and then this cute little girl came over and she just made this card and then she just disappeared. And I love that you, you have the person that um, is a little reticent to do it. And then they wind up making like two to three cards. And then you have a person that just passes through um, and just makes their card and just goes about their day. And then I don't even know where those cards go. That's really, funny to me and part of the process. You don't, you don't know where it goes. Um, I hosted one where, again, same materials, the patterns. Um, the only thing is I uh, eliminated all the other colors. This was for a, uh, a black owned uh, clothing store and um, a knickknack shop, if you will, um, and named Nubian Human. And so I recreated the goal of this workshop was to recreate mug cloth, just using a limited palette of black, browns, and whites. Um, and this one was such an easy sell. A lot of the people that came in that day um, just went right to work. I didn't have to do anything. They just started making beautiful things right away. And it was beautiful. I mean, 
you had daddy daughter dates, you had mommy daughter dates. Um, the the outcome was just really beautiful. I was really pleased with this one. This one I did with AIGA DC. Um, it was called Cards for Humanity. Um, and essentially it was about making a card for your loved one. It did not have to be someone that you're romantically in love with. It could be for yourself. Um, it could be for your partner. It could be for your grandma. Uh, but love is love and I did not want to discriminate. So again, you see the same packet set up. Um, and this one was really fun too. Let me show you these results. I mean, you got some Matisse, you got some like fatigue inspired fabrics, you got emojis. I had no idea where this would go, um, but the people were just sitting at the table and they were just talking. None of these people know each other. <laughs> they just sit at the table and they just start having conversations and they get really excited about what they're gonna do. This one was one of my favorites. Um, he created inside and an outside. Um, it says, you spin me right round. And then you open it and it says like a record baby. I would have never guessed that this was made. I don't even know how he got that text. I guess he wrote it. Um, but it's quite beautiful. Um, but yeah, uh, I guess I'm gonna end on this slide just because this kid is adorable. Um, his name is Sion. He came to the workshop and he was so excited. Um, and I just think his card is so beautiful. It's so simple. It's so creative. It's only using really one material um, on the card. It's just washi tape, just cut to make candles. And he did this and he was presenting it to his mom. Um, and honestly, in my opinion, that is the material that matters. Um, if you'd like to be in touch, again, my name is Jermaine Teron Bell and I can be reached at jermainetbell.com. Awesome, thank you so much, Jermaine. You wanna go ahead and stop sharing your screen real quick. We'll go ahead and do our outro. Great, well, thank you so much to Jill and Jermaine for sharing um, all of this really, really great information. Um, Jill, I'm just so amazed by all the different types of paper and the samples. Like, I feel like I know so many things about, <laughs> about materials and paper and I feel like I learn more each, one, each time I attend one of these talks. And Jermaine, thank you so much for sharing all of your work, loved seeing all the things about the pop-ups, all those happy kids, definitely warming my heart on this Friday for sure. Um, we can create things out of anything and I think that's really empowering. So um, we are a little bit over time. I know Jill already started hopping in Slack, answering some questions. So um, if more people have questions, feel free to drop them in Slack and I'll make sure that they get back over to Jill and Jermaine so they can get answered. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and close out now if that's okay. Um, and thank you so much for everybody who attended. And thank you so much to everyone who's been attending throughout Midwest Design Week. Um, it's been a great week so far. And um, we've got one more event um, happening later this evening at Design for Liberation um, with Teresa Moses. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye.